thank you so much for coming out. Um, I'd like to first introduce myself. My name is Constance Barnes and I am a Vancouver Park Board Commissioner. I also work at the Dr. Sun Yat Sen Classical Chinese Garden as Sales and Marketing Manager. Um, and I'm also an alcoholic. I'm in recovery. And June 12th, there's going to be five years sobriety for me. <laughs> Yay! So um, I think for me, I'm taking this opportunity because my situation was very, very um, open and out there. Being an elected put me in a position. My DUI was on the front page of everything. Being Emery Barnes' daughter didn't help either. So <laughs> it all came out. And what I decided after I went into recovery is that I would speak about it that I would talk about my addiction, that I would be as transparent as I possibly could, but I'd also take the opportunities um, that I'm given as an elected official to talk about this disease, talk about addiction, and see what I can possibly do to give back, because it's a family, in my opinion, it's a family disease or a dis-ease. So with that being said, um, it, I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to meet Dr. Evan Wood. And we've had some great discussions. And I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So hopefully we'll get, um, I'm sure we'll have a great presentation, get some great questions, and um, we will move forward and just know that there's, you know, there's a lot of us out here that are, that are struggling, that are still struggling. And I think anything that we can do to talk about it, take away that stigma of, of addiction, um, and look at what we can all be doing to just make it better for those that are still out there suffering. So with that being said, uh, just a little bit of information that these sessions are held every, Wednesday, every third Wednesday each month where they, um, we hi highlight important health topics and innovations in research and education at Providence Health Care. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation and we'll be handing out paper for you to write them out on. Somebody will be coming along with pens and paper. Um, and I ask that you ask one question at a time and be as clear as possible and I will try and reread it. If you're a little concerned about using names, that's fine. I will read it through myself in the most gracious way possible. Um, for your information, the next session will be on April the 17th and it's entitled, Let's Talk About Arthritis. Oh, I think I'm getting that too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think there's days I wake up and I'm like, oh, geez, you know, hitting 55. It's all starting to happen now. Uh, and it's Dr. Cam, and I'm not sure, Shayanya, head of the UBC, PHC, and VGH divisions of rheumatology. And I hope that you can join us. So tonight's speaker is the one and only Dr. Evan Wood. Dr. Evan Wood is a clinical Epi epidemiologist, nice. epidemiologist well <clears throat> and internal medicine physician at St. Paul's, where he is the director of the Urban Health Research Initiative at the BC Centre for Excellence in HIV and AIDS, an attending physician on the clinical teaching unit and the founding director of Gold Corp Fellowship in Addiction Medicine. He is also a professor of medicine at UBC, where he holds the University's Canada Research Chair, Inner City medicine. Dr. Wood has published over 300 peer-reviewed studies, including a number of groundbreaking research contributions that have had an internal impact on public health responses to drug addiction. So please, everybody, give a warm welcome to Dr. Evan Wood. Yay. Okay. Um, Yay. Well, thank you, um, thank you everybody for coming on this um, sort of uh, stormy evening. When I was uh, asked to give this talk uh, about a year ago, uh, it was a little bit intimidating because I'm normally presenting to a scientific audience, um, but I agreed to do it. And then uh, over the last few weeks, I've been scrambling uh, to pull a, a talk together that I hope um, will be really interesting. Uh, we have about uh, close to an hour, uh, and then after that, there'll be time, uh, ample time for questions. So I have... Uh, fairly ambitious plans for us tonight. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to try and tackle is some of the biology of addiction and take some of the mystery out of why some people become addicted to drugs or alcohol and why others don't. It's actually a fascinating uh, area of science. And one thing that I hope you'll take away from tonight is that the science of addiction is way out. And there's just been huge advances. Uh, but in terms of the implementation science, um, we're still sort of in the prehistoric ages in terms of society's responses. Um, I'm also going to talk about conventional strategies and responses to reduce harm. 
uh, and also talk about a public health model uh, that would actually do a much better job in terms of uh, improving community health and safety. So it's worth pointing out that this isn't a, a new phenomena. This is something that um, we've been uh, dealing with as long as uh, humankind has been on this earth. Uh, this is a quote from the Bible, and you can see it says, Noah planted a vineyard and drank of wine and became drunken. And Shem and Japheth turned their faces away so as to avert their eyes from their father's nakedness and shame. So this is something that we've been dealing with for uh, a long time. But it's very confusing because many of the drugs that are now illegal, uh, not that long ago, were actually legal. So here's a cannabis-based medication, and now things have kind of come full circle with the increasing use of medical marijuana. We still actually use cocaine in the hospital for medical applications, and it wasn't that long ago that cocaine was being used uh, for toothaches in kids. Uh, heroin is a uh, is actually, uh, uh, all of us are familiar with the name of the street drug, uh, but many people don't know that it's actually a patented trade name for a, uh, a pharmaceutical drug that was made by Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Then, of course, um, for reasons that I could spend uh, the entire talk this evening talking about, um, society decided to make these things illegal. And it wasn't uh, that long ago that messages like this were uh, circulating in our society um, and, and raising uh, uh, the belief amongst people that we should make them illegal. Unfortunately, uh, despite making things illegal, these things have not go gone away. And we know that young people have easier access to things like marijuana than alcohol and tobacco. And with each sort of passing week, it seems like there's something else that is contributing to the confusion and fear in our society. And I could have used it as an, as an example this new synthetic drug, Spice, that we've heard about, uh, or synthetic uh, pot, that uh, this is just from last month uh, on CBC. Then, of course, you have the pharmaceutical industries involved in this, and there's huge problems with uh, untreated pain in our society, but because of drugs like OxyContin, we've seen huge health-related harms subsequent to that as well. So in the United States, uh, deaths from overdose from these opioid pain-killing medications are not now challenging things like uh, automobile accidents uh, to be the number one killer of young people in the U.S. So hopefully uh, with that introduction, I've sort of conveyed to you that uh, essentially we're somewhat of a drug-crazed society. And when you think of all the prescription medications and illegal drugs that are swirling around us, uh, it's just a very complicated and scary thing. And unfortunately, this has really been society's response. Uh, there's a huge amount of science, as I alluded to, and some of which I'm going to share with you. And this has really been society's response uh, or that maybe sort of describes it a little bit better, where people see these fears, they're scared, uh, they don't want to talk about it, and there just has not been an evidence-based approach to deal with it. There are voices in our society that are, are complicating things even further, and that the science is sort of saying where we should be going and where we could be going with addiction treatment. And of course, um, you have uh, these types of voices in our society. And the headlines I'm showing you are very recent, and this one is from this week with a columnist in the province taking on our chief medical health officer for his support of evidence-based approaches to addiction treatment and suggesting that there are better ways, which those better ways are actually proven to be very ineffective. So uh, I guess I'll just say that, you know, given all the stigma towards people with addiction and the view to treat addiction as a criminal justice issue, if we can't get the addiction medicine community speaking with one voice, um, we're in huge trouble. So what about the biology of addiction? This is really fascinating, and I'm going to try and make this uh, accessible to, to everybody that's here. So uh, our, our body is made up of cells, and we have specialized cells that make up our brain called neurons. And basically, this is a, uh, there's a great deal of plasticity within our brain, and these neurons speak to one another through neurotransmitters. So one nerve ends, and it speaks to the nerve beside it through neurotransmitters. Now, before you think, oh, maybe I should have stayed home tonight, <laughs> I'll just tell you that these neurotransmitters are involved in memory. So you can't think about relapsing to a drug unless you remember what it was like. Um, other things like mood, and you'll hear about the reward system. Uh, and these neurotransmitters are all speaking in our brain. 
but there's one neurotransmitter that has really been implicated, and that's dopamine. And it's, it's the reward pathway that I will describe that is sort of grand central station when it comes to addiction. So this is a, a picture of my daughter. You can see her with the little skateboarding shoes here and her little dress. She's got her arm around this, her little buddy, and it's just so cute, hey? Eh? This is just so nice, and I think everybody knows how nice it is to give a hug to your, your grandson or your son or someone that you love. And I've just done a little bit ex of an experiment with all of your brains because we are genetically programmed to see images like this and to get a little whiff of dopamine. There are other things that we do as well that give us dopamine. If it's a very hot day and you haven't been drinking water, everyone will know what it's like to have that, oh, that great glass of water, like, oh, why does that taste so good? Or a wonderful meal especially if you're hungry, but a fatty meal or a high calorie meal with a lot of sugar feels really good to eat. Having sex feels good. All of those things are involved in the reward pathway. And the common denominator is that those things, eating, drinking, looking after our offspring and having sex, increase the likelihood that we will pass on our genes to future generations, okay? So that is this dopamine reward pathway and it's that pathway that's implicated in addiction. So this is a, an artist's schematic of that. You've got one nerve ending, dopamine comes out here, there's the dopamine receptor there, it makes you feel good. So it's quite simple. Now, one of the fascinating things about addiction is that the science has shown us in recent years that about 50% of the burden of disease uh, is genetic. So that's why we know that the use of drugs and alcohol tends to run in families. Now you can't talk about addiction and genetics without a basic primer on addiction and basically you have to talk about evolution. And evolution holds that genes are mistake prone when we replicate as a species and all species. It's a very mistake prone uh, uh, thing that happens. And when mistakes are made that provide a survival advantage for a species, those genes will be passed on and that's how species evolve. Of course, if it's a bad mistake and it provides a survival disadvantage, it will tend not to be passed on. So by way of example, this is the Venus flytrap. It grows in arid soils where there's poor nutrients and what this plant has done through evolution is it's figured out a way to attract bugs to come and sit here and then it eats them like you and I would eat a steak, okay? Here are other plants. They have, through natural selection, figured out other things. So this is a marijuana plant. This is a psychedelic mushroom. This is an opium poppy, where heroin comes from. These are coca leaves. Does anyone know what that is? That's a coffee plant. So these, these definitions, um, of course, are culturally defined, right? Uh, but they all work through the same dopamine reward pathway. The problem is, is that if giving your daughter a hug gives you one unit of dopamine, doing a line of cocaine will give you a hundred units of dopamine, okay? So that system then gets hijacked. Now different areas of the brain are, are, are implicated uh, with different drugs, but it's all through this reward pathway. Now these always look quite cruel, and I'll confess I'm not an animal researcher, and um, I actually haven't thought about it enough to decide whether I'm, uh, I'm for it or against it, but for tonight, hopefully we can agree that these animals should not have died in vain, and we can talk about the results of these experiments. So when you measure the dopamine level in the brains of these animals, it doesn't matter if it's amphetamine or cocaine or nicotine or morphine or alcohol, when we're exposed to these substances, we get this huge rewarding effect of dopamine. But I've told you that there's a great deal of plasticity in the brain. And when you have this surge of dopamine, these two neurons, and one neuron is getting hit on the head with all this dopamine, the brain doesn't like that. And these receptors will begin to internalize so that they're not getting this dopamine effect over and over again. And when you look in human studies, these are normal brain scans of normal controls. It doesn't matter if it's cocaine or methamphetamine or alcohol. You can see that people who have been chronically using these substances 
have decreased dopamine receptors in their brain. So that's the change that brings out this state where when people are using drugs either intermittently uh, uh, or, or when they're first using them, they go from this normal state to this euphoric state, and it takes certainly more than six times, but after chronic use, people will find themselves down here in this dopamine deficient state, and they're using drugs just to feel normal. Okay, I'll talk a little bit at the end of my talk about how medications can have an impact there. Now, this is where, you know, you could start puzzling. And that I've told you that there's this process of natural selection where genes that provide an advantage get passed on. I've also told you that about 50% of the burden of disease for addiction is genetically predetermined. So do we have a gene for addiction? And actually... Uh, we do. Now, I don't want to uh, uh, make this too simple. There isn't an addiction gene and you have it or you don't. There are genes that, for instance, will protect against nicotine addiction. So if you have that protective gene, you're less likely to start smoking and it's much easier to quit. There's different genes that predict different types of alcoholism. There's uh, early onset alcohol alcoholism that in young men is associated with fighting. There's types of alcoholism that are associated with later onset. This is one gene that predisposes to the risk of alcohol abuse and opiate addiction, opiates like heroin. And what they've shown is that in animals, and they've done this in the laboratory, there are infant monkeys that when they're separated from their mothers become extremely distressed. And those monkeys also have this genetic predisposition, predisposition to the use of drugs. So the hypothesis is, is that we have this natural trait that is good for monkeys, so you don't walk away from your mom and get eaten by a lion or something like that. Um, but in this swirling context of alcohol and Oxycontin and cocaine and everything else, people whose reward system is wired in that way are more predisposed to addiction. I don't want to tell you that this is all about genes. The environment also has a huge, huge impact. So if you're in a violent or negative environment, that has a huge impact upon addictive behaviors. And it doesn't mean you, you need to have the genes to be predisposed to addiction, because you certainly don't. So this is a, a very interesting study, where these are brain scans of monkeys. And what they did to these poor animals is they put them in a very a sort of negative environment for them. They were individually housed in dark, lonely environments, and you can see what happens to their dopamine level. It goes down and it goes up when they're socially housed. Now, these research papers don't really explain what's happening, but assume these animals are mating and having positive uh, social interactions. But these are the dominant monkeys. And what's really interesting is that the non-dominant monkeys that tend to get beat up or don't get to mate or other things, when they're in a positive social environment, their dopamine doesn't go up in the same way. Then what the researchers did is they said, well, let's give these animals access to cocaine. And when they're in a bad environment, they use a lot of cocaine. And when they're in a positive social environment, all of them use less cocaine, but the ones at the top of the social hierarchy use the least. So you can see how being housed in a violent, bad environment, let's say you're in the downtown east side, whatever it may be, you're going to be that much more predisposed to use drugs. In humans, what's really interesting is that if you look at craving in people, and there's ways of measuring this type of thing, so people who have recovered from, from alcoholism, and you can see that in a neutral environment, they crave alcohol about the same. The memory is an amazing thing, and decades later, if people see something that cues them, the brain remembers, and you can see how that has an effect on craving. But it's not just seeing your old friends that you used to drink with or anything like that, but also stressors have a huge effect on people's craving and compulsion to use drugs. So stress and the environment mixing with our genes through this reward pathway, which I'll try to quickly summarize here. So this is using a, a cocaine as an example. Someone uses cocaine, they get this, this reinforcement, this great feeling from it. Uh, the reward pathway is activated, there's lots of dopamine around. Chronic exposure to that, you get this dysregulation. The, the receptors begin to internalize. The brain is not happy with all this dopamine bouncing around. 
Other neurotransmitters like dynorphin that make you feel crummy go up. This can last for decades where cues will make you start craving again. Stress might make you crave again. You have this negative reinforcement from environment, the environment and other things. Other neurotransmitters being implicated leading to this compulsion to use drugs even when you know, it may mean that your wife is going to leave you or you're going to lose um, custody of your kids and, and the world is looking at you saying, what are you doing? Stop using drugs. And this, this cycle that we know is really a brain disease uh, is what is implicated. Now, I've said nothing about the addictive properties of drugs. So I've ranked these. I'll ask you if that's the correct ranking for addictiveness. Of course it's not. Actually tobacco, and it's not based on because more people use tobacco. If you use tobacco, you are much more likely to become addicted to it. You can see heroin, as you might expect, is up there. Cocaine and alcohol are very similar in terms of their addictiveness. So not all drugs, of course, affect this reward pathway in the same way. I also haven't hopefully misled you to believe that addictiveness equals dangerousness. And of course, if you think about it, people who smoke cigarettes, despite the fact that we know that that's a very dangerous activity, are not likely to have domestic disturbances at their houses because of their violence. They're not going to uh, be drinking and driving and wreaking havoc in our society. So there actually has been efforts to rank the dangerousness of drugs. And this is a friend of mine who tried to do that. Um, his name is David Nutt. He was hired by uh, the government in England to head up the UK Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs. So the government had a designated body to inform them about the risks of drugs, and he went about with his colleagues in a big international effort, combing over the scientific literature to try and rank these things. And it's not an easy thing to do. If you want to come up with overall harm, then you have to think about the harm to the individual, the social, the psychological, and then to others as well. Things like environmental damage they tried to put into this model because, of course, in Colombia where they're growing uh, coca leaves and other things that contributes to harm. So this is what it looked like, and you can see that they concluded that alcohol was the most dangerous drug in our society. Certain things, as you might expect, heroin and cocaine were, were up here, tobacco showed up here, cannabis down here. Now, of course, then the media, this was published in the, uh, a very... Uh, important medical journal called The Lancet, and uh, the media started talking about this and asking, well, geez, you're the head of the government's advisory council, um, you know, you're, you're saying that alcohol is such a big problem, and it started creating such a media frenzy that poor Dr. Nutt uh, was soon on the outside looking in for saying, essentially, that alcohol is more harmful than tobacco, than cannabis. So maybe I'll just try and summarize things before I move on to the sort of question, well, what should we do? Um, as, as I've described, different drugs have different addictive potential and create different harms to individuals and society. The reward system, and particularly the neurotransmitter dopamine, has been implicated in this. The type of drug, the genes that individuals carry, and the environment that we're all in all contribute to compulsive drug use. And then chronic exposure to these drugs leads to receptor changes in our brain that bring about even less self-control. And of course, drug users in society are at risk of suffering major harms. So the question is, then what should society do? And a couple of weeks ago, I guess I, I, guess I was a little bit dishonest because uh, uh, I am usually ch uh, chatting to a, a scientific audience, but several weeks ago I was asked to go and speak at a high school. And so I actually did that, and I was talking about the harms of drugs and don't do drugs to all these kids. And uh, then I thought I'd say, you know, well, this is a situation with these drugs. What do you guys think we should do? And you know, someone in the front row over here puts up their hand and says, "Well, we should, you know, we should make drugs illegal." So okay, someone else over here. Uh, we we should, um, you know, put people in jail that produce drugs. Okay, someone else. Said, well, we should lock up people that use drugs. And much like these uh, high school students, that's really what um, society has done. So this is a poster from the last time the world got together, the United Nations General Assembly came together to talk about drugs. This was 1998, all the uh, nation states that participate in the United Nations agreed to make the world drug free by 2008. It was a 10 year plan to make the world drug free, okay? 
And of course, I think we know uh, that the, that was unsuccessful, um, but because of that effort of treating drugs as a criminal justice issue, this policy has manifest on our TV screens and in our worlds uh, with this cat and mouse game between law enforcement and people who are using drugs uh, in and out of jail. This is probably a good moment for me to point out. I see uh, Steve here from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and he will know that I have many good friends who are police officers. I'm always chumming around with them in the emergency room when they're bringing uh, people in. And, um, you know, I have a great deal of respect for people who are willing to put their lives on the line to try and improve community safety. Um, but as I will describe for you, and as Steve would agree, um, these laws do not improve community safety. And it's very relevant in Canada right now because, of course, uh, the taxpayer in Canada has just made a huge investment in treating drugs as a criminal justice issue. If you get caught with more than six cannabis plants, you will now face a mandatory minimum prison term uh, for that offense. This is what happened in the United States when they did that. And it's interesting, there was a press release that went around today about a bipartisan measure to repeal uh, some of these mandatory minimum sentences. But it just an exponential increase in the number of people, nonviolent drug offenders, that were incarcerated in the United States as a result of this policy. It's been estimated that about a trillion dollars has been spent uh, uh, on trying to lock up people and suppress the, the use and availability of drugs through this effort. And it's had huge effects in communities. So um, the DEA is the drug enforcement uh, agency. And taking so many people out of these communities has huge effects. And it's had measurable environmental effects where you can actually show, and research has shown, that one of the risk factors for young people getting involved in drugs is that they have a parent who has been incarcerated. Now, when I'm lecturing to medical students, sometimes I'll look for someone who's falling asleep a little bit and I'll try to wake them up by putting them on the spot and asking them what's wrong with this photo. And I won't do that to anyone here tonight. But uh, I'll tell you what's wrong with this photo is that those kids are white. And in the United States, with this policy, the vast majority of people who've been caught up in this are African American. So it's estimated that about about one in eight uh, African-American males between the ages of 25 and 35 are incarcerated on any given day. So just huge numbers. More people under correctional control when you consider parole and other things in the United States than were enslaved in the U.S. before the Civil War. And all the people who carry a criminal record, let's say it's even for, let's say it's for a, you're a kid and you get a mandatory minimum prison term for six marijuana plants, you couldn't even work as a janitor in this hospital because of that felony conviction. There's probably no daytime TV viewers here today, but um, that's Judge Judy. And um, I thought this quote would sort of highlight um, some of the stigma in our society towards people with addiction because of uh, these laws and policies and treating this as a criminal justice issue. So I'll tell you that needle exchange programs are endorsed by the World Health Organization and they involve giving out clean needles and taking dirty needles away to get them out of circulation. It's been proven to reduce the spread of HIV. Each case of HIV infection costs the Canadian taxpayer on average about $500,000. So Judge Judy blasted the idea as saying it's supported by Liberal morons saying we should instead give them dirty needles and let them die. I don't understand why we think it's important to keep them alive. And these views that are so prevalent in our society towards people with addiction uh, are just extremely problematic and make it so difficult to try and bring about uh, change. This is an international phenomena and really the sort of, it's like a dragon out there in the world now, this idea that was born in the United States um, some of my team's research is in Thailand, and we were personally affected in terms of our research when, out of the blue, the Thai government decided to launch a war on drugs several years ago. And this is a report from Human Rights Watch that described about 3,000 people suspected of, of using drugs, taken behind buildings, and simply being shot. Hundreds of thousands of people brought up into uh, these work camps, uh, posing as addiction treatment, and what's fascinating is that many of the people that got caught up in this were just in the wrong place at the wrong time and were not even using drugs. Well, in Canada, um, you may have received uh, things like this during the last federal election um, about you know, uh, getting tough on drugs. And um, 
Now, this actually isn't a comment on our Prime Minister. Uh, it's more a comment on our society that promising to get tough on people who use drugs and criminals and mandatory prison terms for people that are caught with drugs is a way to get yourself uh, a majority government. It has huge impacts for uh, the Canadian taxpayer, and this is what the, the implications are. In terms of um, Constance will know, and if you talk to uh, anyone involved in government at a municipal level, the huge proportion of budgets that go to the police. Again, I don't want to be negative. It's just a reality that huge monies are going into trying to address these problems, uh, and we're no closer to solving them. Something that I like to talk about is uh, the, some of the few federal impact assessments that have been done on this. Uh, one years ago was done by the Auditor General of Canada, who concluded, uh, this was in 2001, that 93% of Canada's uh, drug strategy funding went to law enforcement and concluded that of particular concern is the almost complete absence of basic management information on spending of resources, expectations, and results of an activity that accounts for almost $500 million each year. So you can just almost hear the toilet flushing with all this, this money. So I'll tell you why, why that's my belief, because if you look at the, the return on investment. So in Vancouver, we've had this horrible uh, HIV epidemic in the downtown east side, which I'm proud to say there's been about a 90% reduction in new HIV cases, a 90% reduction in AIDS deaths, but that wasn't the case in the um, mid-1990s when this epidemic emerged. Now, when this happened, a very well-described phenomena occurred at the same time, and that was an effort to improve public disorder. You don't want to see drug-addicted people in public. You're running around uh, getting them out of public view. So people will go up in abandoned buildings, under bridges, other hidden environments where we know those are the environments where needles are shared and HIV tends to be transmitted. Now, we also had a problem with the needle exchange program in Vancouver, and that people had great difficulty accessing needles, and it was because the needle exchange program closed at about 6 p.m. each evening. And we also saw that when these police crackdowns were happening, people weren't getting clean needles because they're up in these hidden environments, and that's when, when HIV outbreaks have really been shown to, uh, to happen. If you've ever wondered what um, 100 kilograms of pure heroin looks like, um, that's what it looks like. This was actually on the cover of the Vancouver Sun when I was doing my PhD. And then on page two, uh, was a, a, the caption was, we've cut the head off a snake. And, and that there was this huge uh, cheerleading about the fact that you know, this heroin had been taken off the street. It was going to dry up the organized crime concerns and everything else. So we did a study about this that was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal that actually looked at the effects of this. And really what was happening, envision a, a, a hockey goalie in a net and pucks coming from everywhere. Um, some pucks will hit the goalie. Um, but there was so much uh, uh, heroin coming into the country at that time that actually the price of heroin went down, the potency was felt to go up, overdose deaths actually went up. This was just a marker for the huge amount of heroin that was coming into the country at that time. Now, this past summer, I was fortunate to get involved with a group called the Global Commission on Drug Policy. It's, it's sort of come out of um, Latin America, but there's others involved like uh, Richard Branson, the business uh, guy from the UK, the former presidents of Colombia, Brazil, Mexico are involved in the Global Commission. So they asked some scientists like myself to participate in a bit of an audit of uh, drug policy. And this is one of the things we looked at. This is the funding uh, from the US federal government for the war on drugs. Uh, that was a 340% uh, inflation-adjusted increase in funding to try and suppress the drug market in the U.S. Now, economists will tell you if you're successfully suppressing a market, you should see the price go up and you should see the quality of the good go down. And this is actually what happened is you look at the price of heroin, despite this funding, went down. And that's not because the quality of heroin was worse, but it's actually gone up exponentially. So despite these best efforts to suppress this market, um, organized crime has simply overwhelmed that. 
Now, NIDA is the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. It's the arm of the US government uh, responsible for addiction research. Uh, they fund my lab. Uh, they, they do all sorts of research around the world. And they're very conservative in the conclusions that they draw. And you can imagine, because for many years at least, you can imagine what the uh, policymakers in the US would do if you spoke negatively about the war on drugs. But if you're thinking, oh, that, you know, that's heroin, hasn't really the focus, it's not very common for people to use heroin, mostly we're trying to fight uh, the marijuana problem. And you can see their conclusion is that over the last 30 years of cannabis prohibition, the drug has remained almost universally available to American 12th graders, with approximately 80 to 90% saying the drug is easy to obtain. So these huge investments in treating this as a criminal justice issue, as we know, the potency of marijuana is going up. Uh, it's just been incredibly ineffective uh, treating this as a criminal justice issue. And something that's been a bit of a fascination for me is the links between the experience with alcohol prohibition uh, and the experience with drug prohibition. And when I was a, a trainee in internal medicine, uh, three times in one month uh, when I was working at Vancouver General Hospital, people who had been shot in gang violence were brought into the emergency room. It's quite eerie because, you know, they, they lock the doors, they, they're worried that someone's going to come and finish the job, and everyone's whispering amongst themselves about what's going on where they're trying to resuscitate this person in the trauma bay. And just to be clear, I wasn't on call every night, so for it to happen three times in a month uh, is quite remarkable, but that was a, a horrible time and um, really spawned in me an interest of looking at this question of organized crime and gang violence and the links with prohibition. This has been popularized uh, in our culture. People are probably familiar with this TV show where everyone accepts the, the, the corruption and violence that occurred at that time. This is sort of the modern day version uh, of the, the gangs that uh, are in the news all the time. But actually, according to the RCMP, there's about 120 gangs that are operating in BC. The most recent statistic I could find was 276 drive-by shootings in BC. I almost fell out of my chair when I read that. 276 drive-bys in BC. Uh, they describe the violence as including homicides, contract killings, kidnappings, vicious ordered assaults, extortion, and arson, which continue to be the hallmark of all levels of the drug economy. They're kind of telling us what our laws are doing, um, but justifying the need for more funding because of it, rather than re-examining why we have those laws in the first place. So this is 1920. You've got... Um, the police with their prize there, they've taken some alcohol out of circulation and that's been a great success. And this is something from you know, the last few years in Vancouver uh, on the North Shore Mountains where the police have taken some cannabis out of circulation. This cat and mouse game that just goes on and on. There's other parallels. I think everybody's familiar with the methyl alcohol. We drink ethyl alcohol, but when people were making alcohol illegally, um, through accidents of fate and other regulations that the government put in place, people were using methyl alcohol and people were going blind and dying because of it. This has actually been overplayed by the police, to be honest, because um, this is a rarity and Perry Kendall, our provincial medical health officer, had to point this out at some point. But of course, when you have illegal production of things, um, they can be adulterated with various things. Can anyone else think of a recent thing that's been in the news a lot that is an adulterated drug that has been killing people? Ecstasy. Yeah, so ecstasy, right? Kids are dying from taking a drug called PMMA. I won't try and say the full name of it, but they're not taking ecstasy. These amateur chemists in their basements are making this drug. They're trying to make ecstasy. They're making this impure substance, and kids are dying from it. Your classic example would be a heroin user who buys heroin on the street and it's something much stronger than they thought they were getting, methadone or something else, uh, and, and, and has a fatal overdose because of it. But of course, um, it's not just confined to heroin users now. I've alluded to the corruption and um, you know these aren't old headlines, right? These are things from very recent and it's, uh, it's happening around us all the time. What's been really great is there are people from law enforcement now talking about these issues. And um, there's a group called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And what's interesting is they say, you know, addiction is not our business. And we don't know if this is going to change the problem of addiction. Leave that to the people that are worried about addiction. We're worried about crime and violence. And this is why they're worried. If you look at what happened uh, under alcohol prohibition, that's what happened with the homicide rate. 
and, that, and this is in the U.S., uh, and that's what happened when alcohol was legalized. In the U.S., actually, the homicide rate has a sort of bimodal distribution where it went up again, of course, with the Crips and the Bloods and all the gang activity that has emerged as a result of drug prohibition. And it's right in front of our eyes uh, that this is happening, and police are talking about it. Um, but for some reason, as a society, we have our head buried in the sand, uh, and we're not really talking about, you know, are our laws part of the problem? And this has international implications, and I, I thought I would give the example of Latin America, because our tax dollars are at work contributing to this, uh, uh, certainly in Latin America. And I think everybody in this room is familiar, or at least will have heard about the situation in Mexico. Um, and the Global Commission looked at this question. So we should mention this first. This is, um, this is what $300 million cash looks like. Uh, this is what they're fighting over in Mexico. Um, this was just sitting around in some cartel guy's house. We don't know what the smart cartel leaders have in their houses because uh, they're not getting caught. But that's what um, $300 million looks like. This is the situation in Mexico. So if they've had this simmering violence problem. I can't even tell you what per capita that would, um, that would be. But those were drug-related homicides that uh, they counted during that period. And then the president of Mexico, Philippe Calderon, was elected on a platform to, tra uh, to crack down on the drug cartels. And what happens when you do this, it doesn't matter if it's on a corner. If you take a corner dealer out, that doesn't end drug dealing on that corner. It creates an economic opportunity. Now, if there's two bars, they can get lawyers and use conventional dispute resolution mechanisms. If you're a drug dealing, um, people will fight to gain or maintain market share. And that's what happens when you take out a cartel leader, exactly the same thing. And this is what happened to the homicide rate in Mexico in the wake of that. Now, we're up in Canada here, and you might be saying, well, you know, all that violence and stuff is suppressing the drug market and protecting us here, so that's a good thing. But if you actually look at the data, this is what happened in Mexico in terms of heroin production. It's gone up dramatically. So, you know, about 2 million people displaced, 50,000 people killed, judges, lawyers, mayors, uh, police officers, um, and, and where are we getting ourselves? So what's really interesting is the people that understand this the most are the economists. And they'll tell you that it's just the laws of supply and demand. If you try and suppress a market, let's say we could get rid of a third of British Columbia's cannabis industry, what would that do? It would drive up the price of cannabis and incentivize more people getting into the market. And that's exactly what's happened over the last several decades of doing this. And we've been talking about this for a long time. So this is from 1958, and you can see um, the one paragraph here, at its root is a system of providing narcotic addicts with controlled doses through a government supervised agency. Narcotics traffic will vanish without the profit, and of course, that's the case. What party was he? <laughs> conservative. conservative. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's true. Well, there's lots of uh, fiscal conservatives who understand this issue. This is um, something that the uh, Health Officers Council of British Columbia uh, talks about a lot. And I, I've participated in this work, and it's the public health physicians from uh, all around the province. And we sit around together and we talk about, well, what should we do? And we're in pretty much agreement that promoting the use of illegal drugs through advertisement and promotion and normalizing the use, letting young people use them, um, you know, not worrying about drug-impaired driving could increase social problems, okay? Of course, I think I've described for you that when things are illegal, um, you increase uh, harms dramatically. And there is a discussion, and we've seen this with tobacco and alcohol, where the rules that we apply towards the regulation of illegal and leg legal drugs can have a huge impact upon rates of harm and rates of use in our society. So by way of example, um, there isn't a liquor store in this building, but there is liquor stores that have popped up everywhere in British Columbia. And if you remember um, from, you know, a few decades ago, you had to, you know, get to the liquor store before um, 6 p.m. And it was a government-run liquor store. And that has changed, and it has been shown very clearly that alcohol outlet density increases alcohol-related harm. And in British Columbia, we've had increased alcohol-related mortality because of these changes in the laws. 
So where you find yourself on this curve, and if you're a libertarian and you're out here and you think it should just be, you know, we shouldn't have government getting in the way, then that's fine. But uh, certainly we know a lot about regulation, the effects that can have. I'll give another example. Um, you may have noticed that when you go to pay for your gas or to go to buy a quart of milk, you can't see cigarettes anymore. They're not visible for sale. And that's because people would be going to buy their milk or pay for their gas and they would see cigarettes and they would relapse to their tobacco use. So you can't see them anymore. They have to be kept under the counter. And that's because of studies showing that just that cue of seeing them will increase people relapse to their tobacco use. Can't talk about drugs without covering off um, drug prevention. Um, so people may remember this advertisement from the 80s where um, you know, someone would hold up a, an egg and then they'd crack it into a frying pan and say, this is your brain. And then they crack it into a frying pan and they say, this is your brain on drugs. And this is, you know, this is stop kids using drugs. This stuff has actually really been looked at a lot. And uh, despite the science, you know, we're putting millions and millions of dollars of this in, in Canada into trying to prevent young people from using drugs by showing them these anti-drug messages. Okay? What's really interesting is that when they looked at this in the US, there's an arm of the US government called the Government Accountability Office, and they make sure that the government is telling the truth. And they have shown that there's so much dishonesty in, their, in these advertisements that they're actually in violation of US domestic anti-propaganda legislation. You might think, oh, well, that's okay as long as it's keeping young people from using drugs. And that actually isn't the case because there are scientists who will take young people and they will randomize them to looking at these advertisements versus a control condition like watching The Simpsons. And they'll look at what happens in terms of their drug use behavior. And the only measurable effect of these advertisements is that they tend to make young people think more of their peers are using drugs than actually are. I think we're all uh, familiar with the D.A.R.E. program, um, Drug Abuse Resistance Education. You'll see the bumper stickers, parent of a, uh, a proud parent of a D.A.R.E. graduate. Many of us experienced this program uh, when we were in high school. D.A.R.E. has been studied through so many randomized trials, and I'll just give a little bit of an evidence-based medicine comment here. Everything we do in the hospital has to be based on evidence, or at least it should be. There's been this real increase in evidence-based medicine. And at the top of the evidence-based uh, medicine hierarchy is something called the systematic review. So one study is good, but all the studies together are how we uh, base our decisions. And then we do meta-analyses with these data. So this is a meta-analysis of all the DARE studies. It's an updated meta-analysis because there had already been meta-analyses done. And you can see the conclusion, our study supports previous findings indicating that the DARE program is ineffective. This is your tax dollars at work. If your kids are anywhere between sort of grade 8 and grade 12, they're probably getting the D.A.R.E. program delivered to them in high school. So now, uh, I thought I'd come to addiction treatment, which I could have spent the whole evening talking about, but we can have some, some discussion about it if people have questions. Um, one of my research areas is uh, a cohort of street-involved youth, and we've looked at how difficult it is for young people to access addiction treatment. And pretty much anyone in our society, unless you have the resources and you can go to a private treatment program, uh, it's difficult. And even the standards at some of those private treatment programs are not where they should be in terms of where the science has taken us. So that means that a young person like this, who's using drugs in the downtown east side, is more likely to contract HIV or hepatitis C or die of an overdose than they are in having the full bore addiction treatment uh, that, that we know we can deliver uh, brought to them. And then you see things like this in, in the headlines. And this isn't particularly true because there's a belief, because harm reduction is in the news a lot, that a lot of money gets spent in this area, and it actually doesn't. Um, but there's a real sense that we don't put money into addiction treatment like we should. And I certainly agree. I thought I'd talk a little bit about methadone because that's what was in the province newspaper this week and that, the subject of that column. Uh, methadone is, is a drug that has been studied and studied and studied and studied. And there's so many studies proving that this medication called methadone reduces heroin use in heroin addicted individuals, that there is a meta-analysis by the prestigious Cochrane collaboration. 
They, they're the, they don't take money from the pharmaceutical industry, and they, they, when they decide something works, the whole medical community embraces it. They've actually done a study showing not only does it reduce heroin use, but it reduces the spread of HIV. I don't know of any drug that has two Cochrane collaboration reviews showing that it's effective. Someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but it's just incredible. We know that there's problems with the methadone system in British Columbia. Uh, uh, I could go on and on and on about that, but there are problems with it here. Uh, but it's nothing like the situation in Russia, as is described uh, in various articles, including this one in the New York Times, which described addiction physicians trying to talk about bringing methadone to Russia and a, a Kremlin youth group called the Young Guard barging in and intimidating the people that were there, preventing them from even talking about methadone because it's illegal in Russia. This is what the HIV situation among drug users in Russia looks like. Um, about one in a hundred adults in Russia is now HIV infected um, because of heroin use and because uh, effective treatments like methadone are illegal. Something that uh, I've come to strongly believe will change the system is the problem of not training physicians to treat addictions. And even in the medical community, amongst my peers, when I describe for them that we don't train addictions doctors in British Columbia, they don't believe it. So this is a teaching hospital. If you came into this hospital with probably almost anything, a surgical complication, you had pneumonia, you were having chest pain, whatever it may be, and you may have experienced this, you'll get a nervous medical student come and see you. And then a junior resident, a senior resident, and then a fellow, and then the staff, and they're all walking around as a group of learners, and the medical student becomes a senior medical student, becomes a resident, becomes a fellow, and then we're just training physicians in all these disciplines. There is nothing that exists like that for addiction pretty much anywhere in Canada. North America, it's the same. This is a report from, uh, from Columbia, which I'll try to read from you, for you here. This is from the last year. Um, this report exposes the fact that most medical professionals who should be providing treatment are not sufficiently trained to diagnose or treat addiction, and most of those providing addiction treatment are not medical professionals and are not equipped with the knowledge, skills, and credentials necessary to provide the full range of evidence-based services. And that's certainly the case uh, in British Columbia today. I have to set expectations here because things aren't going to change overnight, but something that really has nudged the system has happened, and that's that Gold Corp has given a donation of $3 million to the St. Paul's Hospital Foundation to create something new here in terms of an addiction medicine training program. And what that involves is uh, addiction medicine electives for medical students, for residents, and a one-year specialty training program for physicians to do a one-year uh, fellowship in addiction medicine. Uh, that's going to start in July. UBC has also got on board, and for physicians that are in practice can get uh, re-entry training for three to six months uh, to learn about uh, addiction medicine as well. So it's not going to change the system overnight, uh, but you can imagine if you were having chest pain and you were brought into this hospital and everyone was kind of looking around like, you know, well, I don't really know what to do here. And that's exactly what happens in most family doctor's offices and, of course, in the emergency room when these people are coming in with addiction. And it's just crazy when you think of the burden of disease in our society from addiction. There's many treatments I could have talked about, and I thought I'd talk about this one, because for me it's just a bit of a metaphor for how broken the system is, and it, it shows where the science has gone with this. So this is a medication called Vivitrol. I don't take money from the company. And uh, it is an opioid antagonist medication. So it goes to the brain, and it sits on the opiate receptor, and it blocks the effects of opiates. So if you snort OxyContin or you inject heroin, it will have no effect on you. This medication is given by intramuscular injection, and it lasts for 30 days. It completely blocks the effects of opioids. It's non-addictive. It has few side effects. It's, a, it's like a, I've seen it in use during my training in the U.S., and patients love it, and it really, really helps people. It's so effective that you have to counsel patients that be careful you don't get hit by a car because if you break your femur and you're in a great deal of pain, it's going to take some effort for us to treat your pain because we're blocking it. You need an intravenous infusion of painkiller. Uh, the drug also works for alcohol. This is a study from the Journal of the American Medical Association. I'm telling you about this drug because it's not available in British Columbia. 
$500,000 on average per case of HIV infection. We're locking up kids who get caught growing six marijuana plants, and tools like this are not available here. And to be frank, even if it was, most physicians wouldn't know how to use it. So it's a huge system change that's required. So hopefully uh, from tonight you can take away with um, the fact that addiction has a, a biological and a social basis. Conventional responses have, have clearly been ineffective and in many respects harmful. A public health model involving structural and medical system changes uh, holds a huge amount of pro uh, promise, but obviously um, leadership is, is really, ne really needed. And um, I see people here from Brief to Action, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, other people from community groups, and um, you know, I think it's just going to be a question of, uh, of all of us working together to try and turn the Titanic around because, uh, as I said at the beginning of my talk, if people that are interested in addiction treatment uh, can't start working together and speaking with one voice, it's going to be hugely problematic. So thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you.